in the psychiatrist's chair. David Irving talks to Dr. Anthony Clare. David Irving was born in Essex on the 24th of March, 1938. His parents separated when he was quite young, and he was brought up with his two brothers and one sister by his mother. His father was a Royal Navy commander, and two brothers were in the Royal Air Force. David Irving attended a direct grant, minor public school, and then went to Imperial College in an experimental scheme designed to turn art students into scientists and engineers. It failed to do this to him, however, and he left before it was completed, having failed a vital subject. After spending a period as a steelworker in Germany's Ruhr, he returned to England and obtained a place at University College London. However, he left after two years and before obtaining a degree, having by then commenced his successful career as a writer. Irving's first book, The Destruction of Dresden, was published when he was only 23. It was but the opening shot in a war that has since waged furiously between him and professional historians and critics. Each book published has provoked an acrimonious dispute. But it was his book Hitler's War, with its flat assertion that Hitler knew nothing of the extermination of the Jews and would not have sanctioned it if he had, which caused fury amongst his critics and allegations of anti-Semitism and fascism. The private Irving was married, is now divorced, from his Spanish wife and has four teenage daughters, one of whom, he revealed to me, was mentally ill. First, David Irving, how does a historian like yourself, who is professionally involved in unearthing facts and details about the past life of others, how do you feel about taking a look at the acts and the feelings, the emotions, the impulses in your own past that have gone to make you what you are today? I'm, I'm fascinated by it. I've, I've never done it before. I'm curious to see what's going to come out. Does anything about such a process worry you? Undoubtedly, I'm concerned about what's going to come out. A lot of my friends have said I'm a fool to come here and sit in front of you and, and lay myself bare. Did you ask any of them why you what? should feel reluctant to come? Because I'm a public figure to a certain extent. I live by my credibility. People who buy my books assume that they're going to read something in my books that other authors have had reasons not to publish, either because they're academics or because they're professional uh, official historians. And uh, my, my own credibility is entirely based on the prestige that I've won over the 20 years of writing. I'm also moving into a different field now in politics, and this is a field in which my credibility is also important. And uh, I suppose my very well-advised and well-intentioned friends thought that I was walking out on a very thin ice indeed in coming here and answering your questions. If um, there was an identifiable influence in your life, what would it be? I suppose the very first influence in my life was my headmaster, of course, at a public school. He's a man who's still alive, a man to whom I look back with great affection, a man with whom I still regularly correspond. And I remember my closing interview with him, of course, when we filed out of the school finally, having got our necessary A-levels and O-levels and went on to university, and I went to shake hands with him to say goodbye. He said, I give you one piece of advice, Irving, and that is, you must never leave a place in such a way that you can't return to it at any time in good faith and meet a welcome there. So no matter how often you feel the temptation to stalk out and slam the door behind you, don't do it. Was that linked with some aspect of your personality that he had observed? Well, at, at school, I'd been one of the most troublesome uh, children at school. In fact, I was the only one who was repeatedly caned. Why? And, uh, well, for various uh, transgressions. It's difficult to recall precisely what I was caned for. They weren't beastly crimes like shoplifting or anything like that or drug pushing. But I remember the very last episode I was caned for was an April Fool's Day prank when another boy and I um, un unveiled a red flag over the school's main gate in such a way that it had to have the local fire brigade called in to bring it down. And I suppose, in a way, I've been unveiling red flags over main gates ever since then. Well, we'll return to the prankster, uh, Irving, in, in, in one moment. The teacher that you describe, he was a major male influence in your life, and one is struck by the fact that, of course, your father yes. uh, left your mother when you were quite young. How young were you? I can only vaguely recall it, of course, because one gradually becomes aware of the fact that one is growing up in a, in a family where there are no men. And your feelings? About when I think about the deaths of my parents, of course, my mother's death made me very, very unhappy, but I can now overcome that. But I can never, ever describe my father's death without, without uh, getting tears in my eyes. Do you know why? Well, I feel very sad for him. He had no family for the last 20 or 30 years of his life, and he had us. But he 
I, we should feel angry towards him because he left us, but uh, we don't. We did what we could for him. He lived with a housekeeper in, in Wales, and uh, we did what we could for her afterwards. Did you ever feel angry about him? I did never, never. Never? Attempts were made to make me feel angry about him. Occasionally things would be said like, you're growing up just like your father. And uh, when he died, uh, I sent telegrams to all the family, of course, and told them the funeral would be, at, would be at a certain time and place. And his own brother didn't arrive, I remember. And I was rather puzzled by that, that his own brother, my uncle, didn't come to his funeral in, in Wales. We went there. And four or five weeks later, his brother wrote me a long letter, about 12 pages long, telling me what a rascal my father had been. In great detail, um, various escapades he'd been involved in, mostly womanizing, and after that my father went up enormously in my esteem, I must say, because he obviously turned into a very human character. I'm puzzled you didn't f feel much anger because your mother, in fact, had to struggle, didn't she, to bring up you, your twin brother, your It sister. must have been an enormous struggle, and I think this is one of the most unkind aspects of, of human life. Just as I, as the last child, the youngest child of four, was beginning to make it good, just as my books were being published, she dies. And I remember that all I could say the night I got the news of her death was how, how unkind, how unfair. Just when we were in the position to, to give her what she had missed all her life, now she dies. The evening before she died, I had an argument with her about something petty. she came come out to see our, our youngest child at that time, who'd just been born, and uh, she... I was reading out a passage of one of my books to her, and she was only wanting to play with the child. And I remember saying to her that, uh, you just don't change. You can't be interested in anything I do at all. And she says, uh, but I'm just playing with Josephine. And then the next day you get the news she's died, and afterwards you kick yourself for the rest of your life, of course. Was that something about her, that she wasn't greatly interested in what you did? Um, not only not greatly interested, but when the destruction of Dresden was published, she, she was very worried about it. She said, what have I... What kind of son have I nourished here who publishes books like this? And uh, the book, in fact, caused the family quite uh, s serious problems. My brother at that time, the eldest brother, was an officer in the Royal Air Force. My twin brother was also in the Air Force. Both of them were summoned to the Air Ministry and to call to account for themselves. But it was quite an awkward period for the family. Had you actually ever discussed Dresden with your no, two brothers? No, not, not with either. You see, our family was a very far-flung family. They were serving in the Air Force at the time of my parents' death. One was in Cyprus, the other was in Sing Singapore, and... Uh, John um, was a twin. My twin brother, yes. But you Jeez. must have grown up with him quite closely. No, because um, from very early on, it became obvious that we were anything but identical uh, twins. He's uh, short and plumpish and bald and wears check suits and smokes a pipe, and he's a civil servant and talks in an in interminable whisper. And uh, he lives in, in Paddington, about three miles away from me, and occasionally we meet. By occasionally, I mean about once every three years. And we get on well together, as long as it's not more often than that. Now, when you uh, left school, what sort of adolescent were you? Um, I was completely uninterested in girls, for example, until about 21. And um, this gave me a lot of time to, to study. I went to school seven days a week. And your first sexual experience? That would have been... Um, I would cast my mind back, and I would say it was when I was 23. No, when I was a steel worker, in fact, in Germany. Very unsatisfactory affair, very unsatisfactory relationship. And, um, but uh, I was sufficiently wise and intelligent to realize that you are not going to get any lasting sexual um, pleasure from a chance encounter anyway. Mm. And uh, really, I was just fulfilling a duty, I suppose, which was expected of me by this particular woman. What about now? I mean, have you changed much? I sense that you're a person not greatly taken with women. I greatly enjoy their company. I greatly enjoy the company of intelligent, bright, and above all, beautiful women. Uh, if, a, if a woman isn't conventionally beautiful, then it's unlikely that I'm going to find out if she's got brains or not, because I'm not going to ask. But and if she hasn't, would it worry you too much? If she hasn't got brains, then I uh, would not to go out of my way to, to share her company, and uh, I would divest myself of her company as soon as possible. So the looks wouldn't be enough? Uh, looks wouldn't be enough, but on the other hand, uh, if they haven't got the looks, I wouldn't find out about the brains. Uh, I'm sure that I do tend to put women down. In what way? Looking around as a historian and reflecting to yourself what women have done, the answer is not very much. They've uh, achieved very little compared to what men have achieved over the millions of years that Homo sapiens has been on the Earth's surface. They haven't produced uh, Mrs. von Beethoven or Mrs. van Gogh or Mrs. Le Corbusier or uh, uh, any great creative talent uh, that one can think of. You say George Eliot? 
They write largely for themselves. It's a disappointing view of women because there's not very much that they can offer by way of disproof. Well, you've four teenage daughters. What do you think they'd make of such a statement? I see what the four teenage daughters are up to during most of the day, most of the evening. In fact, I hear what they're up to most of the evening because it's blared at me from the loudspeakers down the length of this uh, corridor in my apartment. And uh, I don't think that they're going to be writing any Ninth Symphonies either. This view of women that you have, do you think it has affected your personal and sexual relationships, for example, with your wife? This is quite possible, yes. In what way? I think if I was a woman, I would be deeply indignant about sex, because I think that uh, for a woman, a sex act must be regarded as an act of male aggression in some way. And uh, it must be humiliating and undignified and in some way perverse. And the idea to me that women can enjoy this act is uh, rather ludicrous. They do appear to enjoy it, and uh, I'm very grateful that they do enjoy it. But uh, it all seems rather odd to me. How do I know that you're not having me on? difficult because I have no visible signs of mendacity. I don't go red. In fact, if I do go red, it's usually when I'm, I'm no, I, I know that I've been accused of something which I know that I'm completely innocent of. And in, in my fierce efforts to prove my innocence, I'm liable to go red and blush in all the ways that ordinary people blush when they're lying. Yes, no, I'm, 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 I'm not suggesting you are, yes. but I have a feeling that some listeners might say that if I didn't ask that question, I'd be yet another psychiatrist gullibly believing what I'm told. Uh, it's unusual for a man these days yes. to tell me that uh, he regards the sex act from the point of view of a woman as an act of aggression. Some women tell me that. Well, I know I, I was... <laughs> I discussed this with my American publisher, and he was there with uh, a girl, one of the secretaries, and she, she says, uh, I don't think the sex act's aggressive at all. So I said, well, maybe I've been doing it wrong all these years. <laughs> it, it, the sex act, it isn't, it isn't the final five or ten or fifteen minutes. It, it's the days or months that precede it, and that is far more important to me. Is that because, uh, for you, the sex act is a relatively infrequent sort of activity, which you've other things to do? I'm a very, very busy person now. In fact, I, I work regularly around about 16 hours a day. I suppose over the last two weeks I've not had more than six hours or five hours sleep every night. Do you prefer male company? No. No. I like stimulating men to talk with. I've got uh, two or three very, very good men friends, men that I like talking with, men that I can have a good belly laugh with, men that I can talk to privately in a way that I wouldn't like newspaper men to hear me talking. Did you ever fear that you were a homosexual? I think all men are terrified of any kind of homosexual proclivities. Uh, I think all men, too, probably go through a, a homosexual phase. Whether you can even use that adjective is probably too dangerous. I, I remember at public school, particularly at a boys' public school, of course. Uh, that's where a lot of it happens. And I'm sure that boys go through a phase where they're far more interested in other little boys than they are in, in, in their bigger sisters. And I remember there was a couple of boys at school that I was very interested in. And you go out on the football field, and there's a certain amount of comparison that goes on. And, uh, but it's a very, very passing phase. And it is so unimportant that you just, uh, probably for the next 20 years, you'd never think about it. When you went to... Uh Germany. It was after you, you dropped out of Imperial yeah. College. It hadn't, it hadn't worked out. The college hadn't. Why did you go to Germany? The reason was this. I had uh, dropped out of Imperial College because of the examinations failure. I tried at the last year at Imperial College to hold down a job at the same time as doing the, the course, and it just wasn't possible because we hadn't, we hadn't got the money for the scholarship. And um, the danger then came up that I would be called up for national service, and I regarded two years national service as a waste of two years of my life. So rather than that, I volunteered for the Air Force for three years as a short service officer, and they would have sent me to Cambridge for three years to study Russian. In plain clothes, you didn't have to wear boots, you didn't have to wear a uniform, you would be at Cambridge for three years learning Russian. A useful kind of uh, acquisition, I thought, and I passed the Russian language tests, and I got 98.97 in the aptitude tests, a psychological test at Hoban in their recruiting center, and the man said it was the highest one they'd ever had. And then I failed the medical. And uh, this was very annoying, because it uh, rather drew a line through the plan I'd made for myself for the next three years. And I thought, well, you can't just go straight out into the outside world and go back on the building side. You've got to do something adventurous, manly, build yourself up a bit, and earn money. And uh, the steel worker image fitted there, and would give me the chance to learn a foreign language properly, to learn German, which I'd done at school as uh, the A-level subject, and I now wanted to get it properly. Were you ever regarded 
as a German in Germany? No, but I'm regarded as a German in England. People come up to me frequently and say that uh, you're really German, aren't you? And I say, no, why? And, he's, and they say, because, well, there's something about your voice or the way you construct your sentences. And uh, I don't believe this is true, but uh, it happens too often to be pure coincidence. Your Spanish wife's parents thought you were German. That's true. How did you feel about being mistaken as a German? Uh, I, I don't mind it one way or the other, because you've got to realize that I don't uh, tend to classify people in ethnic or racial or national characters and say German, bad, English, good. I think this is a very elementary error that... Uh, people of a lower order would fall into I certainly don't fall into it. I, and I think I've got sufficient education not to fall into that kind of uh, generalization. Did you have views about uh, the Jewish problem when you went to I Germany? Had, no. If I was to think backwards to when one becomes aware of any Jewish problem, I remember that at, previous to the Steelworks episode, when I'd been at Imperial College, in 1956, which was three years earlier, of course, we had the Hungarian uprising and we had the Anglo-Israeli invasion of Suez. And at that time, I remember joining in all the Israeli demonstrations and being very fiercely pro-Israeli and anti-Arab. And since then? Since then, uh, it's again very difficult. It's very, very difficult to remain on a completely narrow path. If I was to look at it from the present point of view, I would say that the, the Jews in this country create big problems for themselves by identifying people they dislike for one reason or another as an anti-Semite, because this instantly provokes in that person a reaction. And I'm fighting down that reaction all day long. I'm writing, I'm, I'm getting letters, the Hungary book is published, for example, in this country the, at the beginning of last year. Now, in my book on the Hungarian uprising, I go into great detail investigating the fact that the Hungarian people had this perception of their government as being largely Jewish. The, the communist regime in, in Hungary was largely Jewish, and this is uh, an objective fact, and it was so perceived by the Hungarian government, and this caused a lot of unhappiness, which eventually led to the uprising. Now, when this book was published, a book in which I devoted a lot of very serious research, in which I thought was a very fine piece of work, I don't often say that about my books, um, I had a lot of slime poured on me by the national press in this country who accused the book of being anti-Semitic. And I think this is a, a, a very unpleasant position to be in because you find yourself defending a position that you haven't really stated in the first place. I had to put in the adjective Jewish at various places in that book just the same as I put in the adjective Catholic, uh, Protestant and Calvinist. But the only people who have objected to the description are, are people like Neil Atchison and Arthur Kerstler and the other critics who, to whom this has become a buzzword. In this book it was important because the Jewish issue had played an important part. All other historians and writers have ducked the issue and they went through religiously rubbing that word out. Well, as I thought would happen, we got distracted really into the, the public, um, yes. David Irving, because it's very difficult. In this case, the public David Irving and the private are very close together. It's a very narrow path that you have to walk on. But, but returning a little to the more private person, you, uh, you married a Spanish woman. Yes. And uh, I don't know quite how long that marriage lasted, but 20, I gathered it years. split up last year. 20 years, yeah. Can you tell me why? Um, I suppose it's the so-called legal profession who've done, who've, who've, uh, done the damage there. Not you. I, uh, not me at all. I'm absolutely blameless. I mean, who could be more innocent than I? It's, um, I think, a great tragedy of this country that we have the laxest divorce laws in the world, I think. Your wife applied for it. And the initial steps were taken by Mrs. Irving, who, after 20 years of marriage, began to feel vaguely uncomfortable and the feeling that she could have done better somewhere else and that uh, her life wasn't entirely wasted. And I suppose all sorts of um, illogical feminine emotions began milling through her. At, at that time, and I defended the family as long as I could against the, uh, the legal profession for the next three years, although I could have made it very easy, quite simply, by capitulating three years ago. And then uh, finally, in, in May last year, I then had to divorce Mrs. Irving because the legal profession was taking such uh, a toll of my time and of the family's uh, capital that I had to go ahead and uh, switch the whole thing off. I understand that uh, about three years ago, your wife and four children were sent off to Spain. You were um, quoted as saying in a newspaper interview that uh, the climate of education in London was, had become so ugly mm. and the atmosphere of pornography so uh, disgusting in the West End that you'd sent them there really for, for their protection. This is true. And, and you see, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, we took the decision to move to Mayfair when we had to, uh, the lease on our other property expired. And we had to take, we had a choice literally between living in Mayfair in the heart of London next to the American Embassy or a country house somewhere in Surrey. 
What I didn't realise, of course, is that bringing up young children in London, is a, in central London, is a major problem. Everything is on their doorstep, including some of the ugliest things, and you can't watch over four children uh, 24 hours of the day. But of course, very many people do manage to bring children up reasonably successfully in the centre of London. Yes, I'm sure. I'm sure there are all sorts of reasons why uh, this was a problem. Uh, first of all, these were t children. Uh, they gradually grew up realising that they had been, uh, they were in a quite a well-known family. They grew up um, in conditions of great affluence. Uh, they had things which certainly I never had as a child. And uh, this must have rubbed off th on them in a, a disadvantageous way. Did they suffer by being your daughters? No, no. The, the history teacher at the school said, we don't think very much of your father's writing. So I said, will you ask your, your school history teacher what he knows about the Battle of Waterloo? You'll find he won't teach you very much. Well, what did your daughters think of being transferred to Spain? They objected. Traumatic. They were convinced it was a joke. The actual dr uh, journey out to London Airport took place on April the 1st, three years ago, and um, they thought it was an April Fool's joke, and that at the last moment Daddy would con confess it had all been one ghastly April Fool's joke, and they were going to turn around and drive back that afternoon and find themselves actually being put on the plane with their mother. It was no joke at all. And, uh, but the eldest at this stage was, was 15. The eldest was uh, 15, and um, they lost their friends in London temporarily, which I was not sad about, because they had, in fact, the two eldest children made friends, which I was not... But your relationship with your 15-year-old was such that you could put her on a plane to Spain? Oh, yeah. With their mother, yes. Yeah. And they were, going, they were looking forward to it, too, because they, were all, they always liked Spain. But um, I then took steps to ensure that they came back to London quite frequently, like every three or four months, and they would spend a week in London. So it, I, I did realise how it caused problems. Do you regret it? Yes. It Why? Was, um, because of the effect it had on the older two children. Because of what happened to the older two children, in fact. And things happened when the children were no longer under my supervision. That wouldn't have happened had I been keeping an eye on them. I mean, has that been uh, uh, traumatic to your relationship with them? I'm sure. I'm sure. But I, I, I've kept uh, as stable as I can under the circumstances, and I've put up with their reproaches. And uh, I know the, the reasons which I did uh, were watertight at the time. And in fact, uh, together with Mrs. Irving, we drew up a memorandum on the precise reasons why we, do we were doing it. So later on, there could be no dispute about why we had done taken the decision to move the family out. Do you think that makes any difference? I think so, yes, because later on, and I know this only too well as a historian, memories do cloud, and one is liable then to be at the short end of the stick, and uh, you are accused of having done things for all sorts of different reasons. And we were both very clear in our minds on that April the 1st as to why we were taking that step. I sense that you lay a great deal of emphasis on the value and the virtue of logic, yes. whereas feelings for you are often irritating, they're subjective. Well, they are. Uh, I, I, I think you're, you're dead right. I, I do try and work out logical reasons for doing things, cost-effective reasons for doing things. Do people ever say that you've no feelings? Oh, yes. I'm, I'm pre frequently accused of being callous and brutal. And are you? I don't think so. I think that uh, running a family is rather like running an army and that somebody has to be there to, to say, right, I've taken this decision and I think it's the right decision. It may turn out to be wrong, but... You mean that the accusations that are made about you as a historian are made about you as a father? That you're brutal and that you're insensitive? Um, I don't think anyone's accused me of being a brutal and in insensitive historian. Rather, rather different. They regard me as being brutally clinical and brutally objective as a historian, I suppose. But Be better put. Yeah. Uh, let me rephrase the question. Yeah. Brutally clinical brutally insensitive as a father and as a historian. Well, these allegations are only made against me by the children when they're, they're coming to me and they're, they're, they're failing to understand my reasons for not immediately knuckling under. But you say this all the time. You've got to realise that a mother and four daughters form a small mafia and they do tend to club together when it comes to screwing anything out of their father and I'm sure that lots of fathers listening are going to be nodding their heads sadly and saying, too true. I have no doubt and you're now playing to them. They're right. but, but the fact of the matter is that in almost everything we talk about, when we locate a, a subject where there's very real difficulty and somebody has made an accusation against them, you marshal facts to meet this objection. Yeah. Uh, but, in, but, but the, the yeah, common no. denominator is that David Irving is described in a uniform way by different groups of people who know different aspects of him. Does that ever make you think that they might, leaving aside the facts that you've marshaled so magnificently, does that ever make you think that they might actually be right? No, I think that you're using, you're using language in a clever way. All right, we both agreed that I'm a brutally objective writer and a brutally clinical writer, but I, I think that this is not nothing to do with the word brutal that we would use in applying to a father who brutally beats his children. I think that this is just a clever play with words, really. Well, words, as you well know, can be very dangerous. You can play with them, indeed. I mean, for example, I've never known quite what you make of 
uh, to, 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 to bring it back to your historical arguments, and uh, the much, uh, almost uh, an Irving prank, I sometimes think, against organized professional historians, where you uh, make the challenge that if they produce a written piece of evidence that Hitler actually ordered the extermination of the Jews, then you'll give them a thousand quid or something like yeah. that. For the small malicious glee it gives you at yes. discomforting the professional historian, you're prepared to risk the insensitivity of it all and the pain it causes I to many so. ordinary I think, Jews. I think that the, the ordinary Jews are enraged at me, if, any, if anything at all, because I have distra I've detracted from the romance of the notion of the Holocaust that six million people were killed by one man, and to find out that the six million people were killed by 100 rather grubby and ordinary criminals definitely detracts from the romance, and that is what they begrudge me. But I can't help it, because that's my sincere view. I don't think there's any evidence that uh, it happened any differently. I haven't got any axe to grind. I'll be quite happy to accept uh, if, if I'm wrong. Are you somebody with passionate feelings about anything? I, I'm a passionate feeling for sticking my neck on a chopping block if I think I've got something right. And uh, I don't really care if I'm going to lose tens of thousands of dollars if I print something that's unpopular. I and could be a very, very rich writer indeed now, and I'm not. I'm a very poor writer, but I could be very rich just by having written orthodox history. Your feelings, for instance, don't worry you ever. You never feel sometimes that your feelings are out of control. I, I, I occasionally catch myself uh, succumbing to feelings. What sort of feelings? Uh, of, of great remorse or, or I suppose, self-pity. I was very, very sorry when my father died, and I, I can never describe his death without ever, without, without breaking down. It's, uh, it's, it might a great regret to me. But uh, otherwise, I, I can keep a pretty mask-like countenance, and I mean, people do begrudge me that. You'd never worry about being mentally ill? I think a lot of people who are intelligent in, in it or work with their brains are deeply worried about the prospect of either falling mentally ill or being mentally ill. Well, and, have uh, you ever felt that you were breaking down? I've sometimes had to work so hard, particularly over the last two or three years, when I've been working desperately hard to get a book finished, because publishers are about to foreclose on me. And uh, on top of that, something else happens, and on top of that, something else happens. I remember one of my friends said to me last, uh, last year, a very close friend in London, she says, uh, David, I've got to hand it to you. This last year, you've, you've seen your marriage break up, you've seen one of your children fall seriously ill, you've published two books, you formed a political group. You've done all that, and you're not, you're not collapsing. But sometimes I felt on the point of it. But in fact, you're quite proud that you haven't. I, and as soon as I thought I was, I was about to, I decided the best way to avoid it was to improve my physical well-being. So I started taking very uh, serious uh, physical training steps. I, I now go running every, every morning for half an hour, and whatever the weather, and so on. I mean, you don't actually derive support from personal relations? to see you through dark nights? It's very difficult to establish personal relations with somebody at my age. It's, um, I, I don't know. We, I would have, it would have to be a, a, a great miracle to find somebody with whom I could relate. I, I was thinking of one's family. Well, they're being taken away from me, you see. Uh, the, 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 the daughters will automatically be allocated, my wife. But while you were going through this strain and stress, yes. they, they were all around? Still are, as they I still understand. Are. They still are, yes. So it's, it's one of those quirks. And I'm defending that position as long as I can, but it, it will undoubtedly happen. There's not very much I can do about that. Why are you defending it? They don't seem to give you a great deal in terms of emotional support, strength. I think the children, teenage children, need to have both parents as long as they possibly can. And although I could have... You mean they need you? out three years ago and have saved our family £50,000 no. in legal fees, I decided to take the much stonier and harder and more expensive course of fighting on... What I mean, mean was, do you need them? I understand that you feel they need you. Do you need them? I think, I think all parents need their children in a certain way that parents get a lot of selfish pleasure out of watching children grow up. Mm. It's, a, it's a very hit and miss affair bringing children up. When you were writing uh, Hitler's War, and indeed yes. uh, Pathway to War and so on, um, did you ever identify with Hitler himself? I think you have to. You have to identify with your subject. And in the case of Hitler, certainly if you want to be able to write the kind of books which I write, and in the case of Hitler's War, my readers will remember that uh, it's written actually from behind his desk. Indeed. You're getting everything as Hitler himself saw it. An ambassador doesn't go to see Hitler, he comes in to see Hitler, and the, the book literally closes with the moment that Hitler raises the pistol to his right temple and shoots himself. And it's quite an interesting way to write a book, and uh, the interesting thing is having climbed into that skin and to be able to climb out of it once you've finished it, and I think I've done that. What are the things you identify with? Uh, with other people? No, with Hitler. 
His ability to exclude extraneous detail when making decisions. He would regard his brain as being some modern computer into which he would feed all the relevant data, and then he would go to sleep on it, and then in the morning he'd wake up and the decision would come plopping out. And uh, I, I like to regard myself as having that kind of attitude to decision making. You must have formed some view about his mental capacities. Not so much his capacities as his status. You know, and I know, that so much has been written about yeah. uh, Hitler and his uh, mental Well, here again, condition. it's purely subjective, isn't it? I mean, we, we were told throughout the war years one thing, but then I've gone to great trouble in, in the recent years, particularly in writing my biography, to find out what his own doctors thought about him, who were men of regular professional medical upbringing, including army doctors, who are about as square as you can get. And uh, the opinion of every one of these doctors except one was that Hitler was sane until the end, and that one was Hans Karl von Hasselbach, and he said that he thought Hitler was beginning to get delusions of grandeur towards the end, but then uh, Hasselbach didn't treat him for the last six months of his life, so mm. he's not really qualified to judge. You've had some personal experience, not yourself, yes. of mental illness, but you mentioned your yes. daughter. It's, it's uh, Until that, until we had this illness in our family, I was very, very... Um, Skeptical. If I would read a, a court report and I see a psychiatrist being called in to give evidence, then I would be become very impatient. Uh, now, having been through this, and having written a very detailed diary indeed of how it affected our family, there was the only way I could get her off my shoulder and keep my brain clear to write. I, I, I wrote down every day every single detail of this tragedy that affected our family, all the, the remarks and the statements and how the thing went on. And uh, I read court reports certain cases, and uh, I can see the identical symptoms and the identical uh, illness, in my view, and I've become very Ill, very impatient with the judge who won't listen to the medical evidence. I would prefer not to talk, I suppose, about the illness of your daughter in any detail, yes. because... It's a very pr uh, a common illness indeed, in fact, and uh, I think one reason why I can talk about it is that uh, we have been told that she's as cured as... She as can be expected, she has made a miraculous recovery and she's coming off medication. And, uh, Do you feel in any way responsible? No. Um, I would have felt responsible, I suppose, if I hadn't gone into it in more detail and if uh, I hadn't learned a great deal more about this illness uh, since, it, uh, since it happened. Why would you have felt responsible? Because I would have uh, believed that uh, uh, any kind of mental illness was an, Ill an illness that was brought on by the environment. For example, a brutal father might cause a mentally ill child. But in fact, this is the kind of illness which is latent in a lot of people, millions of people, four million people in the United States have this illness, and it's latent in them, and it needs just something to trigger it off. One of which can, of course, be a brutal father. It can be one, but in fact, there was, uh, in this case, it was almost certainly something the child had been taking, uh, slimming tablets. So, so what, is, what is it that David Irving would like to do, be it through politics or writing, whatever? I mean, what is it you want to say? I've, I've always wanted to influence people and, and, and destinies. And uh, for the last 20 years as a writer, I've been in influencing people's opinion. And now I want to start influencing their destinies. And, uh, Why? Well, I suppose everybody has some kind of, no, everybody has some kind of uh, talent, maybe only a small talent, maybe a large talent. I was telling my, my oldest child, the one who was ill, I said, well, this illness you have, it has a, an advantageous side, and that is that a very large number of geniuses have had this illness. Van Gogh, Michelangelo, they all had that illness, and we just had to find out what is your particular talent that you're going to be great at. And um, I suppose the talent I have is that uh, I've got enormous ambition and uh, energy and personal drive and a pretty clear sense in myself that I'm right. About what? about ways of doing things, about the ways things have to be done. And I think this is one problem that the existing established parties in this country are suffering under, that they are, they are incapable of doing things in ways that are right. They are just going to continue doing things in ways that they have been done in the past. Well, how would you describe yourself? Um, and we're talking about this yes. in relation to your um, ambition. I don't think there's any one political adjective that would describe the way I feel. I suppose I'm, I'm a very patriotic, dedicated, clear-thinking person, and I've tried very hard to keep myself ready for this moment, in as much as uh, I've never smoked and never drunk, and I'm very anxious not to gradually deteriorate in the way that people otherwise might between the ages of 40 and 50. You make it sound as if there is a, a moment of destiny approaching. Oh, yes. 
Oh, yes. Has your experience as a historian uh, affected you as, say, someone like myself, who's not a historian, might have expected, which is to be suspicious of people who have a sense of personal destiny and a, and a feeling that other people's lives should be placed in their hands? Somebody has to do it. But somebody has to be the person who takes the decisions, and I think the important thing is that that person should be a person whom the rest of the people can trust. And uh, I think that uh, if I've been doing anything for the last 20 or 30 years, it's been trying to establish that people can't frighten me into adopting views which aren't right. Supposing your sense of destiny is correct, and that the British people turn to you, what is it that you would want to do for them. Well, I'm not saying they're going to turn to me. I'm sure that somewhere in England there is somebody else like me to whom they may turn. Maybe me, maybe somebody else, maybe somebody who doesn't, hasn't even applied his mind to that at, at this moment. Um, I have 40 years, I think, in which to do it. Time, well, I, time isn't running out very fast for me. Well, you probably wouldn't answer this question, but I'll ask it nonetheless, given the fact that you're embarking on a public career. Do you ever have the, the doubts that maybe you are the person or even one of the people uh, for this kind of enterprise because of psychological aspects of yourself or because your life up to now has illustrated not just your strengths but some of your weaknesses? Do you ever have that doubt? I think we, we learn out of all our weaknesses and the important uh, factor is not to pretend that one is perfect. But on the other hand, never to lose one's self-esteem and one's self-confidence and the belief in one's own future. Even when there have been times when that belief has actually contributed to somebody else's suffering? I don't think it ever has. You don't think it ever has? No. That a man can assert himself fully and confidently and not uh, at the expense of his fellows, ever? Certainly not in my own personal uh, knowledge. So looking back, there is nothing really for which you feel ashamed. I think it was a mistake to get married. Because? Getting married takes 20 years out of your life. Getting married, raising a family, and dedicating yourself and your resources to raising a family is uh, like bloodletting. It should be the one thing or the other. It may have been my one cardinal mistake. But because it uh, harmed you? Yes. I, had, I've, I have always had these ambitions, and I think that getting married was an unnecessary deviation. Otherwise? It's been a successful life. I don't regard uh, any aspect of it as a failure. In fact, uh, I regard the illness of my child as having been uh, a test granted to me by God, which most parents are not granted to, to face up to. That was David Irving talking to Dr. Anthony Clare in the psychiatrist's chair, produced by Michael Ember. <laughs>